Thank you all for coming for module seven. And this module is focusing on effective communication for public policy and advocacy. And during this module, we will learn uh, to do some power mapping and ways to success part. And this module is organized by Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, and Joyce is our Western States Campaign Coordinator with UCS. In her role, she coordinates policy campaigns to advance climate and environmental justice and engage UCS's Science Network members in the Western States. I hope all of you are UCS Science Network members. If not, there will be a chance for you to join us. Um, she helped pass the advanced clean trucks rule in California, and Joyce has a bachelor's in chemistry and has worked in various justice-oriented ad advocacy roles prior to UCS. All right, Joyce, take it away. Cool. Thank you so much, um, Melissa and, and everyone for having us. Um, thanks for pulling up the slides as well, Melissa. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here with you all. Um, I um, am gonna go, so Aaron gave a great example of a real life example um, of how we use power mapping and how we go about uh, pushing for policies in, in our state. And I'm gonna kind of break it down a little bit to the basics um, and just run through um, what is power mapping and how do we think about it. Um, so I guess before I get started, I'm curious, um, how many of you have done power mapping before? And maybe give like a thumbs up or something if, if you've done it before. I know some people were uh, putting, putting some comments in the chat earlier, which is great. Um, yeah, who has done it before? It'd be good to see roughly how many. Cool, so maybe just a few folks. Um, so this is exciting. Um, I think power mapping is something that we all have an intuitive understanding about, but maybe we haven't done it before. So um, I'll definitely walk us through that um, in a kind of step-by-step -step way. Cool, can we go to the next slide? So first of all, when we think about power mapping, we have to think about well, what is power, right? Um, and so when we want to advocate for a policy like the advanced clean truck rule, we have to think about what, what power do we have as advocates, as scientists, as people, as parts of organizations. Um, and so um, at its most basic, um, a definition of power could be the ability to make your vision a reality. So how able are you to get, get what you want in the world? Um, and in a more advocacy focused lens, um, when we're thinking about decision makers and decisions that are being made, um, the question that, that I would ask is, how do you get a decision maker to say yes to you? Um, and even if they don't want to. So if a decision maker really wants to say yes to you, it's gonna be a pretty easy ask, right? You just ask them, hey, will you do this? And they'll be, yeah, sure. Um, but really um, where we think about power mapping and getting more deeply into it is, what if a decision maker is kind of on the fence or they don't know if they want to support you or maybe they're actually even oppositional to like from the get-go to what, what you're talking about and how do you get them to say yes um next slide so power mapping is when we map out the the power dynamics that are at play so we can figure out how we can get certain decision makers to say yes to the things that we're asking to say yes to so um, a couple questions um, to kind of set the stage for power mapping. Um, first of all, you know, what needs to change? And then in that process of making change, what needs to change first? What's kind of the first move that we need to make to get this, this change rolling? Um, where is that change made? So what uh, decision-making body, what regulatory agency, uh, what person makes that decision. Um, we need to know who can make the change we want to see. Um, and that's the third one. So um, we're going to be focusing on um, sort of the second and third one. Um, I think as you all are thinking about policy advocacy, you have to think about, well, what's the policy you want passed and how do we actually get there? But then who do we need to to make a decision on that policy. And we're really gonna focus on that today. So uh, next slide. So uh, once we've decided who the decision maker is going to 
is on this topic, we want to ask ourselves a few questions so we can understand uh, what the power relations are as we're asking this person to um, say yes to what we're asking for. Um, so before this stage of asking these five questions, we will have wanted to have done our research. Um, where does this decision get made? And who is the person who makes it? Now we know who makes the decision, so we gotta ask these questions. Um, so as we're thinking about a decision maker, first question, oh, sorry, it says one twice, but <laughs> it's meant to be two. Um, so first of all, what are their biggest interests and track record on the issue? As Aaron mentioned, this is something that, that is always important to do, to understand what that decision maker cares about and, and how they voted in the past. Um, secondly, what do they stand to win by saying yes or lose by saying no? So, you know, if you, if you want them to say yes, how is that gonna impact them? And how are you going to have to um, be able to justify that for them to make the decision that you're asking for. Um, next slide. So third question is, who can directly influence them? Personally, professionally, or, or in any realm? And this is definitely a big question as we're literally mapping, doing the power mapping exercise that we're gonna get into. Um, as we think about the decision maker that we care about, like, who else can influence them? Like we can influence them as scientists and advocates, but maybe there's somebody else that they actually really listen to or like whose opinion they really, really trust. And so we want to understand who it is that we want to get to support us along the way. Um, and same, uh, similarly, number four, um, whose support is especially important to them and why. So number three, um, can think about who has a direct line of contact to them, right? But number four, maybe, you know, who, what constituencies do they care about? As Aaron mentioned, perhaps for legislators, it's their, it's their literal constituents. Maybe um, for somebody like, you know, who really cares about the environment, environmental organizations are a really big, um, important support for them. So it really depends on the decision maker. Um, and number five, what has prevented them from saying yes so far. So as I mentioned, if they were just gonna say yes, it would be really easy and we wouldn't have to go through this really. Um, but, but it's really important to map out those who might be a little bit on the fence or who we really think could say yes, but haven't really said yes yet. Um, cool, so next slide. So, um, it's also important as we're thinking about what power we all have and what power you all have in making, um, in asking decision makers to say yes or no to something. What, what, is, what is your role? What is it that you can offer to them? And as a scientist, there's many things that you could potentially offer. Um, for example, um, your expertise, uh, maybe you're an expert on this topic. Um, or maybe you're just an expert in, in science in general, which is also very um, important. Um, credibility. So what have you done? What, what, you know, what institutions are you a part of? Like what research have you done? Um, research, you could actually be doing research that's directly applicable to the topic. Um, support, do you as a scientist support them um, and their work um, and their candidacy? for example, um, and then connections, like what, who else are you connected to that the decision maker would find beneficial for them as well? Um, so yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of potential things that um, you all can offer as scientists. Um, and it's also important to think of what you can't offer them, right? So there's plenty of things that we can't offer and we have to be clear about that. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of uh, John Holdren, who's a science advisor um, to President Obama. And as you probably know by now, there's a lot of roles within agencies or within the government where there are actual science advisors. So potentially that, that's a place where you could be, um, or you could be kind of on the outside like UCS where we bring science um, you know, from, the, from an external perspective. Um, cool. Uh, next slide. So 
this is a power map. We've been talking about power mapping. You're probably wondering like, what is power mapping? What is a power map? And this is an example of one. So as we're asking all these questions about how we're gonna influence this decision maker to say yes, we have to understand how we can get them to say yes. And by in the process of doing that, we need to understand who our allies are, who are the people that this person's gonna listen to, who are our supporters, and how can we all advocate together for this decision maker to, to, to say yes. So when we do power mapping, the decision maker is at the center. So we're trying to think about them and what do they care about? Um, so for example, um, maybe they have friends, maybe they listen to their friends. Um, you know, if your best friend told you that they really cared about something, you might listen a little bit more um, because you trust them, you know them, you know what they're about. Um, they might have advisors, um, they might have science advisors, they might have other types of advisors who are kind of like their, their go-to people that they ask for their opinions about. So if those advisors want the decision maker to say yes, then it's much easier for the decision maker to say yes, right? Um, and there's all these other people that can influence the decision maker as we think about what that decision maker cares about. Um, these can be either people the decision maker knows directly, or it could be like, for example, advocates in an area where the decision maker really wants to appear like they're a strong advocate too. So for example, like if a decision maker really cares about pet, like animals or something, um, then maybe like the SPCA or like other animal oriented organizations would be really good to influence. So the decision maker says yes to whatever it is. Um, so um, Melissa, I don't know if it's easy for you to pull up a blank slide, but uh, what I was thinking we could do a little bit of an interactive activity um, going off of Aaron's example. So in the advanced clean trucks rule, um, we needed to convince the car board to say yes, right? To vote yes on this rule and to vote for the strongest rule possible. And probably the most important person on the board is the board chair. So um, in this case, Mary Nichols, but we can just say generally the car board chair, right? Um, so maybe you all, if, if you don't mind dropping it in the chat, since I know it might be hard to do hand raising and, and speaking uh, on, short time scale, but who do you think the car board chair cares about based on Aaron's presentation and also just generally using your own intuition? Like who, who does this person listen to? Um, any ideas? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Logistics companies. Yeah, absolutely. Donors. Yeah. I mean, the governor, um, absolutely, yep. Given that CARB is a, um, a technical agency, do you think there's a room, room for technical, technical members of the community to influence CARB as well? Yeah, absolutely, supply chain management, folks who work in the trucking sector, um, donors. Um, I think in CARB, it's, it's a little bit different because they're not elected officials. And so actually donors probably play less of a role than, for example, like in the legislature, if you're trying to um, influence elected officials. But, but definitely you're on the right track. Um, scientists, yes, definitely. Um, manufacturers unions, definitely. Um, what about the public interest, right? CARB is mandated with passing rules that will help, help our climate and also um, reduce air pollution. So who might they care about in that realm? Affected poor communities? Um, yeah, there's definitely certain communities, largely black and brown communities within California who are more impacted by truck pollution than, than others, definitely. Um, employees of these companies, truck drivers, definitely. Yep. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a really great list. NGOs, definitely. 
Yep. So yeah, as we um, as we worked through our um, our campaign to get this policy passed, we had to think about all these things. Who would um, the chair of the card board listen to? And then we had to think about how can we work together with all these different groups to show a very strong concerted effort to support a strong rule. Um, and that's that's pretty much what we did. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of these things that you listed are great ideas and very much um, consistent with with where we went. So, um, if you if we, um, you know, if we had a little bit more time, we could actually go back to that slide. Um, we can go back to the slideshow, Melissa. Um, we could actually draw out a map like a really detailed map of the car uh, board chair and just like map out every um, every person, organization, entity that, that she might care about. Um, another one to mention is the legislators, as Aaron mentioned, that was, that was a big one um, because the legislators signed onto that letter and the car board, you know, cares about what the legislature thinks um, that, definitely was part of um, part of our power map too. So yeah. Um, can can we see your screen again, Melissa? I'm sorry, I thought I was still sharing my screen. No worries. Awesome. Cool. So this is just a we don't have to go into this too much, but once you've developed a power map and you've decided who you want to influence and with whom you want to influence them, you can think about what tactics you want to use. So for example, like letters, town halls, hearings, uh, lobby visits, petitions, here's like a kind of exhaustive list of different tactics you can use once you've decided um, who you want to influence and who you want to be influencing them with. So um, I think I'll kick it off to Aaron to talk a little bit about communications um, with, with um, policymakers. Yeah, and it's a lot of like reiterating what I had already mentioned, but um, I find, or we have slides too, um, I find that when you're, when you're communicating with a legislator, um, again, it's like very important to, um, to stick to kind of high level points um, again, I work with a lot of scientists and like it's it's a little hard to like get things down to a few bullet points um, but you have to really stick to like your top like three messaging points you want them to walk away with. Um, and another thing I really can't reiterate enough is if you're talking, no matter who you're talking to, you should know your audience and do some research on who like who their power maps are and who they listen to. For the legislators, um, you know, obviously I want to believe that they all care about their constituents. So I'm always trying to take it back to their district where they live. Um, I'm based in Sacramento. So I know that if I'm going to go talk to my um, local elected official, um, you know, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is like, I live in your area. And that literally gets their attention because I'm actually a vote. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I start with that in communications. Um, I think it's important I just can't overstate it enough. I keep saying it, but like, just stay as high level as you possibly can. Um, and I think again, sticking to like that community health impact level um, is really important. I um, I stick to a rule of like one page if I can. Anything past one page, and I feel like you just have lost people's attention. And if they want more information, um, they can seek it out as well. Um, and I always walk away or I always go into a meeting or um, something with an ask. So I want to leave them with an action to do at the end. So if I am going to talk to legislative offices, please sign my letter supporting the advanced clean truck rule. Um, I'm giving them my whole spiel, but at the end, I always have an action item. And my action item for them is to please take this letter back to your legislator or, you know, if I'm talking to staff please think about signing this letter. My ask is the letter so that when I follow up with you in a few days over email, you already know that 
my ask is for that letter and I'm going to follow up. Hey, are you, is your boss fine signing onto the letter or Hey, assembly member, do you want to sign on to this letter or do you need more information? So always have a goal for what you're trying to communicate um, and make sure that you're leaving whoever you're communicating with, with that um, item. So if in the letter, one of the last things I wrote on there in the second page was air resource board, please adopt the strongest rule possible. Thank you. And then you do the signatures like, you know, I'm sure you guys all know like basic letter writing, but um, sometimes like, you know, these people are really, really brilliant, but they're also really busy. And I think as communicators, it's our job to make it as easy and digestible for them as possible. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to like dumb it down or anything. It just means that you have to think critically about what is the most important thing that they're going to walk away with. Um, or if you're power mapping, what is the most important power source you're trying to get? You know, if you're a scientist talking to a legislator, then you're, you know, you're going to want to show a little bit of expertise, but again, like take it back to this is why they should care. Um, and so I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, I don't know, Joyce, if you wanted to talk about the scientist letter that we did, I think that was like, so impactful um, uh, in, in being a successful role on this event. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into the details of the whole campaign we did a little bit later. But one of the things that we did was that we got scientists involved um, in the public process. So we actually did a scientist sign on letter with public health experts, air quality experts, and experts in transportation emissions generally. Um, to sign a letter calling for the strongest possible rule. And we got about 100 something scientists to sign on. Um, scientists um, from all over the country, including some pretty big names in, in public health and air quality. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a, sh a show to CARB that um, the scientific community also really cared about this rule because, you know, as we, um, you know, as we go through these public engagement processes um, at these agencies, sometimes, sometimes the room is empty and they don't actually hear from anybody. And sometimes the room is really full, but they're hearing from a lot of industry, they're hearing from a lot of, you know, different interest groups. And so to hear from scientists is actually a little bit, um, it's not, it's not a given. And so um, the fact that we were able to get a lot of um, experts in this area to weigh in, I think was important. And actually one of the CARB board members is a, a professor at, and a doctor at uh, UCSF, I think. Um, and he's an air quality expert. And actually one of, in the process of getting signatures onto this letter, one of his colleagues actually sent the letter to him. And he was like, yeah, like really support this. And so it was like, for him to hear from his trusted colleagues that they cared about this was probably pretty impactful for him um, to feel like he had some support in, in supporting this rule. So um, you never know how it will go, but in this particular instance, like having scientists weigh in um, was important. So definitely there's a role to be had for, for scientists. Um, yeah, do we want to go to the next slide? So another, um, another aspect of communications is that scientists can actually write or speak out um, in these processes. And so here's just a couple of screenshots of um, ways that scientists have gotten involved in, in, in issues, um, public issues. Um, Obviously, scientists can write op-eds, scientists can do their research, et cetera, and it can be covered in the media, which can also have an influence on our decision makers. Um, I know that um, in the truck rule, we had um, a few op-eds in some pretty um, important newspapers, including the LA Times, and those types of op-eds also really, um, you know, show CARB that uh, there's a lot of support for the rule. So. Um, next slide. Cool. So that's, um, that's most of what we have on power mapping. And just to review it all again, as you're thinking about power mapping in your, in your own context, um, the first step when we want to actually map out our decision makers is to find the right target. Um, so 
you know, for example, like the governor, like the governor is a very important decision maker, but the governor didn't really have that much influence on this rulemaking. So like that wouldn't be the right target, but maybe the governor is the right target on something else. But in this case, we knew we needed to influence the cardboard chair and other cardboard members. So find the right target, research your target, figure out what they care about and what their record is. Um, examine relationships and identify allies. So this is where a lot of the power mapping comes into play, where you think about who has the power to influence this person? Who, um, who do they listen to and who do they care about? Um, and then four, once you've decided that, then you start thinking about tactics, you start, start thinking about how to have these conversations with decision makers, um, as Aaron was talking about, and think about all the different types of tactics you, you might wanna use. And then five, um, of course, you have to do things at the right time. Um, there's, it's a little bit of an art because sometimes the time isn't right. Um, and sometimes the time is right. Um, I mean, we were talking about this at work today, actually, like, you know, when COVID first hit, like a lot of our work kind of, we were trying to figure out where we're gonna go with our work because there was a major public health crisis right in front of all of us. And it wasn't really the right time to be talking about like, I mean, it always is the right time to talk about climate change, but it wasn't the right time to be going to elected officials and trying to hammer the point of passing a climate bill, right? Like that, that wasn't the most pressing issue of the day. But as we're in California right now, and we're seeing like these massive wildfire outbreaks and just like a massive climate crisis kind of like in, in all of our consciousness, this is the time when the governor and other folks in the state are really thinking about how to make bold climate uh, policies. And so, for example, now is a time where we can really think about what it is that we need to, to have a more um, survivable future for all of us. And so we at work have been thinking about how, how we want to use this time right now, because it's a different time than say six months ago. Um, and you want to be tactful in how you're pushing for the things that you're pushing for, because, you know, as Aaron mentioned, we have to think about what the legislators care about. And if they care about their constituents and none of their constituents are thinking about this right now, like they might not be as receptive. So definitely, um, want to be tactful with our timing. Um, so yeah, um, I know that. Um, we want to have some time for breakout groups. Um, maybe it would be helpful for me to share a little bit about some of the work we did on the advanced clean trucks rule. Um, given some of this, does that sound right, Melissa? Yeah, if you want to talk a little bit about the coalition work for a few minutes, and then I haven't been able to take a look at the chat, but I think there are some good questions coming in. Um, so we can spend some time on Q and A, and then. Um, have time for breakout groups. Awesome. So I'll just go through real quickly um, about the coalition work that we did on the events clean trucks rule. So as Aaron mentioned, um, we we needed to think about the actual mechanism of the decision making body. So CARB, how does CARB work? How does CARB board work? Legislators and what kind of influence they have. And for me, um, as our campaign coordinator, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to create the external pressure and the external conditions to make the cardboard feel like they needed to pass this rule. Like it was ab absolutely essential for them to pass the strongest rule. So how do we do that? We wanted to show them that people all across the state and even across the country um, really cared about this and that it would impact people's lives and that it would make a big impact on climate, on health, on a whole bunch of other things. And so we thought about that. Who, who are all the stakeholders um, in this issue? Environmental NGOs, environmental justice communities, public health folks, doctors, scientists, um, labor folks, businesses, um, you know, even agencies in other states, um, you know, we came, we came up with this long list of potential allies and we built a coalition around it. We had regular meetings, um, we drafted public comments together. We really wanted to show them 
how many different types of stakeholders cared about this issue. Um, and that was part of our power map, understanding that the cardboard would ultimately care about, you know, how, how do people in California think this rule will impact their lives, will impact the environment, will impact all these different facets that the rule touches on. Um, and another, another one of the tactics that we used is, was to show like a, an overwhelming amount of support for the rule. So we did, you know, um, action alerts and petitions. We had scientists actually submitting public comments through the public comment portal. So during these 45 and 15 day comment periods, CARB will open up a link on their website and you can go on there and like, like type in your little comment and submit it. And so we actually had, um, I think, 30 some scientists actually write out their own comments in addition to um, having this pretty solid uh, expert letter. Um, a lot of our partner organizations also got a lot of people signing petitions and sending in comments through this portal. So CARB on the other, on the other end saw this like really, really, really long public comment portal filled with comments. And they also had public hearings, which we organized around. So we got people to show up. We got, you know, community members from truck impacted communities, like labor partners, environmental NGOs, um, health experts, all kinds of people actually showed up in person and provided testimony as to why this rule was so important. And we actually ended up having like hours and hours and hours of testimony where the car board members just had to sit there for like the whole day and listen to people talk about why they cared so much. And by the end of those hearings, the CARB board was like, wow, like, it's really obvious to us that a lot of people care about this. And like, wow, the impact on community is like really important. And if we hadn't shown up and literally been in person in front of them and made them feel the weight of this policy, maybe they wouldn't have been so eager to pass a strong rule. Um, that really kind of shifted the scales. Um, and uh, we actually got the rule to be twice as strong as they originally proposed. So originally they proposed something that we thought was a little bit weak. We put the pressure on them. We brought all these people to the hearings. We submitted all these comments. And then when they came back with a new proposal, it was twice as strong. So, you know, it, it's hard to say what exactly changed their minds, but, but our advocacy definitely pushed them um, to, to make a much stronger rule. So the, the happy ending is that the policy did pass. It was a unanimous yes vote by the whole board and it was twice as strong as they originally proposed. So we're really happy about that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a rule that may change the way our trucking sector works. Um, many people have never really seen electric trucks before, but the technology is already ready. It's there and it's just waiting to be deployed. Um, and so in the next, you know, several years and, and decades, um, maybe we'll be seeing a lot more electric trucks on the road. So, so yeah, happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, Joyce. Um, before we dive into questions, while folks are typing them into the chat, I wanted to um, just emphasize a few things that Joyce touched on. Um, and First, that uh, power maps can look very different depending on what scale, um, who your target is, um, how much you can easily find out about them. Um, so there are no perfect answers when you're creating a power map. Um, do as much research as you can, but recognize that these are often about you know, human relationships. And so um, don't try to get it perfect. Just try to do the best you can. Um, and then, you know, at some point you've got to call it and, and start deciding on what action you're going to take. And the whole idea of the power map is to help inform the action that you're going to take. It's not to create this like beautiful, perfect um, map. Um, and second, I think as Joyce was just touching on, you are not alone in engaging in policy and advocacy. Like one person alone was not going to be able to um, get the strongest implementation of the clean trucks rule. There are so many organizations and individuals and interest groups and industries who are involved in this process. Um, and so you should rely on those organizations and coalitions who are involved to 
do some of the heavy lifting for you. Like you as an individual don't have to create a power map of the cardboard member for, uh, chair necessarily. Like other organizations have probably done that work and you should uh, rely on their expertise and ask them how you can fit in instead of uh, starting from scratch. Obviously, if you want a power map for fun, like totally go for it. Um, and then, uh, and uh, organizations and coalitions can also help you with things like figuring out allies and uh, the right time to engage as an individual or as part of a coalition. Um, yeah, and finally, something I think that Joyce touched on, maybe that I already touched on too, is that there are just so many things that influence policy and whether or not it passes or doesn't um, and how long it takes to do that. So just be ready <laughs> to be involved for the long haul and recognize that engagement can look very different at different points in the process. Um, and that's part of the reason why um, we had that slide and maybe we can um, share the slides with you afterwards of like all of the different tactics that you can take that may be um, applicable at different points in the process depending on who you're engaging at that time and and sort of where um, where the level of support is. I feel like I've talked a lot now so I want to see if there are any questions from the group. And Aaron or Joyce if there's anything that you wish you had touched on before um, and you want to chime in, feel free to do so. I'll just say that if anybody ever has any questions um, on California legislature, where things are, I'm happy to always answer. If you have a pet idea and you want to know if it's been done before, feel free to email me and I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I will also add that um, Feel free to be in touch with me as well. And as um, Melissa mentioned earlier, um, we do have our science network, which I know many of you are aware of. Um, I'm gonna drop a link here um, in the chat. So if you all are scientists, science advocates, or just interested people even generally, um, you can sign up for our list. And, you know, for example, this advanced clean truck rule work, um, we actually, um, sent those action alerts out to you all. So um, if, if you're, for example, in California and you know you sign up for our science network list, like you would have actually gotten a chance to send in your public comment and we would have made it really easy for you. So you just click on a button and like type it in and, and it's, we kind of try to make it easy for you to get involved. Um, so if there's any um, interest that you have in, you know, participating in some of these advocacy efforts with us, um, we'd love to be in touch. Um, there's ways big and small that you all can be involved, all the way from just pressing a button and signing a letter to actually coming and speaking at some of these hearings with us um, and like coming to meetings with us, um, writing your own op-eds and your letters to the editor. Like there's such a range of ways that you can get involved. Um, so definitely feel free to be in touch if, if that's of interest. Yeah, Joyce, that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing up the Science Network again. And not to like keep plugging UCS, but just as an example of um, any NGO that you want to get involved with, you know, they may be sending you emails saying like, sign this petition or sign this letter or come uh, meet with decision makers with us on the Hill. Like, we're not doing that just for fun like we're doing that because we've strategically decided like what legislators need to move on this policy is to hear from their constituents and we're organizing a lobby day for that reason um you know we don't have time just to organize lobby days just for fun unfortunately um but and you know joyce mentioned how that scientist sign-on letter uh was really impactful in getting uh legislators to pay attention to this issue and recognize that the scientific community and the public health community in particular um, really cared about this issue. Um, it looked like there was one question in the chat. Um, is there a connection between a power map and a mind map? Erin um, or Joyce, either of you want to chime in on this? I'm not sure that there is, but I'm not super familiar with a mind map, to be honest. 
got, I'm getting nothing. So maybe that's something that we should research afterwards and, and get back to you. Um, and Erin and Joyce have both put their emails in the chat. So feel free to follow up with them if you have questions um, afterwards about power mapping or um, getting involved in, in policy and advocacy, especially in California.